Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mick McGrath. Uh, I work for Locality and welcome to our webinar talking about endangered spaces. Um, just so you know, this uh, is being recorded, so it's a resource where you can listen to it uh, should you fall asleep at some point. Hopefully you won't, but um, it's there for you or to share with other people if you feel this is something useful for people to have. So today you've got three for the price of one in terms of presenters and I'm going to hand over to Steve and Anna in a moment who are going to talk you through um, what what the the program is all about what they're looking to do um, and some of the ideas around that and then I'll move on to some of the locality uh, thoughts in terms of approaches to how you work with communities and how you get the best results and taking on that journey so I think um, just just other other quick things um, we've got some polls set up as well so you have some voting it should be fairly clear when the poll comes up you've got the opportunity then to sort of just vote on those um, and then you vote as quickly as you can and then it provides us with a bit of feedback and a bit of intelligence so feel free to join in that um, so without further ado I'm going to hand over to uh, Anna I think who's going to sort of just give you an overview of the program and she will uh, tell me when to move slides on Thank you, Mick. Um, um, my name is Anna Hinchliffe. I'm one of the community programme managers um, within our community team at Co-op. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. Um, I think you probably most of you would have been at the Member Pioneer conference or will have seen some of the news that came out from our AGM earlier in the year where we announced our community plan for the next three years. Um, you'll hear this talked about quite a lot, I'm sure, um, over, the coming, over the coming months and coming years. The first thing that we're going to start to really engage and start to talk to our customers, members, member pioneers, colleagues about is around the, the Spaces campaign. Um, and I think it's probably a, a quite important to, to highlight at this point. Whilst we do talk about the three pillars in terms of Spaces, um, well-being and education and skills. These three things don't really operate in silos, as I'm sure you all know. So just bear in mind as we're going through the, the kind of the webinar here tonight and when you start to talk about the three pillars, um, just I guess just keep in mind as an ask from us that we, we don't want to think about the three pillars just in isolation. We know that they all impact on each other and they, they work together really. Um, can I just move the slides on, please, Mick? So we've we've done quite a lot of research over the last couple of years. Um, we know from the Wellbeing Index research, we know from our joining events that we've done over the last 12 to 18 months where we spoke to over 10,000 members and customers. Um, and we know from localities research that the UK is losing the publicly owned buildings and spaces at a, an astonishing rate. Um, and the freedom of information research that Locality did last year showed that it's, it's an average of over 4,000 buildings that we lose um, every single year, which is, is having a really bad, bad impact on our communities, as, as I'm sure everybody's aware. So it's, it, it's buildings that are, that are really crucial and critical to playing a part in allowing communities to come together and people to come together um, and once they're gone they're gone forever um, and we've just put a, a, an astonishing fact on there one facility is being lost every two hours so if you kind of extrapolate that it's it's by the time we finish this webinar that's that's half a half of a swimming pool or half of an allotment that is no longer there for public use um, can we move on please Mick? Thank you. So that's why Co-op have come together with Locality to save some of these spaces. And when we're talking about spaces, we mean um, parks, we mean allotments, we mean uh, libraries, swimming pools. So it's, it's buildings and outdoor spaces that we're, that we're looking at initially. We've committed to help to protect, support and improve over 2000 social spaces in the next three years. And the reason that we're doing that is because we understand the importance that those spaces play in those communities. And we want to really demonstrate the co-op difference by showing how by cooperating with each other and coming together for the benefit of the community, we can make a real difference. 
you're going to play a really, really big part in this. We want our member pioneers to play a central role in bringing bringing together our members, our customers and communities to make some really great stuff happen. And over the next hour or so, Mick's going to go through some of the the initial basic steps that you need to, to know um, about what locality can do to support you. We have got more webinars in plan and we would love to know from you. I think there's a poll at the end. We'd love to know what you think we should do next and what you think would be really useful to help you with this. Um, it's going to be, a you know, it's a long journey. It, we're not going to fix everything overnight, but we really want to try to use our resources and use all the assets that co-op have and use the years of experience and knowledge that locality have to really make a, a big difference. Uh, can we move on, Mick? Uh, thank you. So um, one of the things that we've announced this weekend as well is the first time that co-op community have ever joined together with the co-op foundation to make an announcement at the same time. So you may have seen this over the weekend or on Friday when it launched, that the Co-op Foundation is going to be inviting community organisations to apply from, for funding in their Space to Connect um, grant, which is a new partnership with government. It's match funded through Co-op Foundation and it's aimed at bringing people together to connect and cooperate within a space. Um, that is only in England at the moment because it's funded through DCMS, but Co-op Foundation do also offer interest-free loans and some other grant funding and um, locality are also working with sister organisations across the UK. So if you're a member pioneer that isn't based in England, don't worry, we've not forgotten about you. There is still help, support, funding, etc. available to you through this programme. Uh, thanks, Mick. OK, uh, is that... Steve, is there anything, anything you want to add in before we move on? I think Anna said the scene really well actually. My my role as some of you may know is as one of the regional member pioneer managers so I'm sort of on the webinar this evening to sort of help uh, put in context some of the strategy we're talking about and maybe answer some of the questions that um, participants may have around how member pioneers can bring this this ambition to life and how what it might look like in your communities. So not much add to add at this stage but hopefully pick up more in the Q&A later on. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, just so you know, hopefully you can see it, there's a, a box which if you click on the arrow is for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to type them as we go along. Uh, and then, as Steve said, we'll do a question and answer mop up at the end to try and um, hopefully answer all those questions as best we can. So, yep, yeah, if you're sitting comfortably, then let's begin. And of course, my laptop is frozen, but there you go. OK, here we are now. OK, just by a very quick introduction to locality. Um, we're an organisation uh, based in England, but as I said earlier, and we do have sister uh, organisations in the, in the countries. And we're really here to support local communities to unlock the power in their community to create a fairer society. So I suspect we do all the things or try to do all the things which are important to you and probably why you wanted to become pioneers. Um, we have 700 members ranging in size from groups with very limited resources, literally sitting around a kitchen table, uh, to those with multi-million pound community businesses. Uh, so, for example, um, we have uh, one member based in Hull uh, Goodwin Trust, who in effect deliver an awful lot of services within some large inner city um, community council estates in, in their areas. Um, anyway, they're all based in their local communities, have strong community engagement and representation, and they're all driven by supporting and wanting to support people to have choice and opportunities in their lives. So it's very much uh, about the idea of we, we don't like to see inequality. We want to see people being being given the chance to really able to help themselves and for other people to to be able to help their communities as well. Personally, I've worked for Locality for nearly six years now. I'm based in Nottingham. I really like my job because I'm able to support inspiring people who are dynamic, enterprising, willing to take risks and who genuinely believe in creating fairer communities where they live. Lots of people I do work with um, are other people who have come from business but really want to give something back. And that sounds really cliched, but I think it's only true that there are lots of people out there who do want to give something back. Um, 
and prior to that I spent 12 years working with what was called Big Lottery Fund so again I've got a lot of experience of working in a community setting. So I'm going to attempt to do the first poll um, and I'm just going to bring it up now. So hopefully you can see this. Um, and the question is, where are you from? England, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Uh, just so I know, is, is, this, is this coming up? Can people see this? Okay, should, should have launched now. So hopefully you can see it. Um, Okay, thank you very much. I can see from that then that the vast majority, nearly 90% are from England, 8% from Scotland, none from Northern Ireland and 5 from Wales. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm now going to do a second quick question. Which is, um, hopefully you can see that. Uh, yeah, what, what type of space? So the vast majority of you have said 56% are interested in um, working to save a building. Uh, a third of you are around green space, none for sports and 11% for other. Um, so thank you, that, that's a good, good spread for us. It helps us uh, see and understand a little bit more about what you're interested in. So I've got a sticky, here we go. Okay, right, let's move on then to um, an example. And I'm sure it's the sort of thing you're coming from uh, and you're sort of coming across. So this is an example near to me. It's very topical. It's happening uh, currently over the last few weeks. Um, and in this instance, a local authority investigating the sale of a large hall in the center of town. Um, the community have got wind of this. And in a few weeks, they've got nearly 3000 people in a petition. Uh, people attending council meetings and putting pressure on the councillors. Um, the community are investigating registering as an asset of community value and they are currently interested in individuals um, as, as individuals rather than they haven't set up a group yet but it just shows how quickly people can mobilise when they feel um, under threat that they're going to lose resources. So it's not just a case of, in this instance, lobbying and hoping the local authority changes their mind and says, oh, well, actually, we won't sell it after all. The reality is, with budgets being stretched, there's a huge uh, pressure to sell assets, particularly where there is a good commercial value on the land, and there certainly would be around this one. The centre does have users, but currently not enough to cover the costs. Um, and locality reckon that any community facility uh, should be looking at occupancy rates of 80%. And a lot of the time, a lot of community facilities don't have that. Sometimes they're not pushed enough. Sometimes it's people have just done it their own way. So, you know, this is part of the challenge which uh, you will come across uh, time and time again. Also linked to this, the, the reality is that any campaign needs to have dedicated people who are willing to learn, needs more than a few, and you'll hear this as we go along. Um, it's really important to engage the community, so it's not just a few people decide they're going to do something about it and then do everything, because that, that their way lies madness and burnout. Um, so it's also about having a good vision, a story to tell through social media, through activities and events, and enterprising approaches and solutions are so important to get people thinking they can they can do something about this and coming up with good ideas. Um, it's also really important to have people uh, who have an ability to respond and react quickly, to have good networks and also to find ways of finding friends and growing support. It can be really, really easy for people sometimes to file this sort of thing under the too difficult um, to have or to do. So it's really, really important to kind of get a group of people who motivate each other, support each other. Um, and it's really important to have start to finishes in your group. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of personality tests you can do, but it's amazing how many groups are actually all filled with the same kind of people who have 
very useful skills, but not necessarily the right kind of skills. So it is all about being able to build up teams. Um, OK, so this is really what the rest of the presentation is going to be about, is uh, an explanation of the endangered spaces work and the supporting documents which locality have put together. We've tried to write those in plain English. We've tried to have them uh, brief and succinct. Um, but, you know, the reality is we're here then to be able to provide you with more detail and more support as, as you progress and go forward. So hopefully um, it's it's fairly clear what this is about. But, yeah, briefly, we're going to talk about what is a community space, about setting your goals, finding endangered spaces, getting people behind your project, types of community ownership, simple ways to help endangered spaces, funding for community projects and groups and your next steps to help save a space. So hopefully you're aware of this. There are three documents uh, which we have put together. Uh, the first one, uh, the Endangered Spaces Toolkit. Uh, together we can save community spaces from extinction. Um, is is uh, sort of you know reasonably light touch. It's about sort of 15 or so pages. Um, and then we've got a sister document to that, which is around sort of 11 odd pages. And then we've also got um, reading the Endangered Spaces Toolkit, which is I think it's got well over 40 uh, links, hopefully very useful links, which will save you a lot of time in terms of searching for information and and ways of, of finding answers to, to questions and growing those. Hopefully also aware that um, on Friday, I think it was, we launched the Registering and Endangered Spaces uh, Advice Forum. Um, or Advice Form, where a colleague of mine, Jeremy, uh, will be providing uh, generally email responses to people between the 28th of June and well into July. Um, I said this will primarily be email, but knowing Jeremy, you will get very, very detailed uh, responses um, and he's got decades worth of experience working in the sector. So, you know, he's a really useful resource. Um, and I was speaking to him earlier on today. He was telling me they've already, he's already averaging around 12 inquiries a day. So, yeah, please do use the facility as much as you possibly can because that's what it's there for. And he does like a challenge as well. OK, so let's move on to um, examples of successfully saved spaces. Uh, they include uh, workspaces, um, they include industrial buildings, heritage and art facilities, visitor centres, sports facilities and swimming pools, shops, cafes, pubs, cinemas, car parks, community centres, nurseries, woodlands and nature reserves, allotments and land which has the potential for development for community use, including housing uh, and lots and lots of others. So there's a whole range of wide sort of things you can go at here um, and sometimes it'll be about picking your battles as well which are the most important ones to try and save in some communities there may be a number of facilities at risk at the same time and the reality is you will need to prioritize and focus on watch which ones have most community support and spirit and fight behind um, so here's another example of where a community space has actually fall back um, and in this this one it's an interesting one again it, it's in Nottingham Stonebridge City Farm um, just before Christmas they thought they were going to have to close uh, the farm's been going over 40 years um, and they decided as a sort of buying themselves a bit of time that they would do a campaign to see whether people would would actually try and save um, and save the farm. They needed to raise £30,000 to stay open for three or four months and what they were really pleasantly surprised by was the fact that actually they managed to raise coming up for £120,000 over that sort of three, three month period of time and the reason they were able to do that is because they didn't realise how loved, how treasured, how valued that city farm was, how ingrained it was in communities from across the city and, and wider uh, and as a result, when people heard it was going to close, they really made a conscious decision. They wanted to um, do something to rescue it. And as a result, um, what they've now got is an opportunity to, to put things right, to address some of the uh, funding issues, to increase the uh, community business opportunities and sort of grow it. So, 
you know, it, it's a really, really heartwarming story of actually where the community do come together and, you know, where they're showing determination. But the reality is you can't do fundraising on this sort of level every year and expect you're going to get that same kind of interest. You're just not going to. Uh, but certainly it does show a good example of where communities come together and what's important and that they will really work hard. Um, so one of the other things you need to do as a group, um, and it's, it's important to understand this, is start thinking about um, how you how you sort of bring people together. Um, and this this sort of is, is a vision document uh, I sort of use with groups a lot. And it's a really nice, easy way of starting. Um, just sitting down with groups and just getting them to understand what is it they're there to do? So what's the difference they want to make? And, you know, vision is very often literally a few words which kind of stick in someone's head. Um, and if everyone has the same few words in their head, it makes it much easier for you to be able to garner support and get people interested in, in what you do. So it's, it's a case of then sitting down, thinking about uh, what your vision is. So what are you there to do? Uh, your mission is largely about then thinking about that in a little bit more detail and then thinking about goals in terms of what you're there to do, how you're going to do it and then think about your values. I mean, values are really important in terms of you know, how inclusive do you want it to be? Are there particular people you want to um, join in with this to make sure it, it actually happens, um, which is, again, really important to kind of know. So it's just a nice, simple document uh, we use with with community groups um, as a way of just making sure that they can then sort of sit down. And the good thing about something like this is a nice one pager which you share with groups and it feels um, good. And if you're an organisation which then looks to grow, this is a useful starting point for things such as business planning. And business planning, I'm not going to talk about now, but it's something which a lot of people think, oh my gosh, that's really, really uh, complicated and detailed. Well, actually, it doesn't need to be. It can be something quite simple like this and sort of uh, working it up and developing it as you go along. So this diagram is a case of stating the bleeding obvious, I guess, and I'm sure you're aware of it. But generally, um, the earlier stage you're at, the simpler the project, then the less time and effort is required um, in order to sort of develop up that idea. So, for example, um, if a group want to tidy up their local community um, and they want to arrange a litter pick, well, you know, you can generally do that by a call to arms, putting up some flyers, um, someone getting some bin bags and possibly some gloves and away you go. If a group were looking to actually save, let's say, their local community library, which is at risk of closure, we know there's lots of examples of that. In this instance, uh, it's going to require a lot more time and effort because it's a lot more complex. And as a result, um, you need to be prepared for that. So, you know, it, it is about trying to just make sure whatever you do is as efficient as it possibly can be so people can, can uh, you know, move through it and, and sort of progress in that way. Um, so, yeah, I just, just thought I'd sort of share that with you as a, as a setting your goals, making you sort of think about how you might want to grow and develop it. But by thinking about manageable bite-sized chunks as well is really important too. So uh, people aren't overwhelmed, overawed uh, by everything that needs to be done. Okay, so finding endangered places. Um, sometimes endangered places, spaces make themselves known, such as council intending to close, uh, that example I gave earlier on, and sell the facility. Um, so uh, you may pick it up through social media and so forth. Other times, mapping your community spaces can be a powerful tool to help you identify where you in where your endangered uh, community spaces are. So, for example, linked to swimming pools or libraries, parks, um, post offices, pubs, and so forth. It's easy to do and doesn't require any technical tools. I mean, each community is free to decide for itself what it values, but there are three main reasons why a community space might be considered important. The first one is it might be uh, that the land or building itself it has some sort of historic or iconic uh, value to the local community. It might be the activities or services which are delivered from the community space, uh, such as library services, uh, provide support 
linked to education and skills. A civic building allows people to meet and bring people together. And thirdly, it might also be for future potential of a site, uh, thinking about the community, thinking about what could become of that site. So uh, one of the things locality are involved in with others at the moment are community-led housing schemes. And they're, they're really, really wonderful because you think there's no way a community could be able to build um, some housing, but actually they're increasing examples of communities doing just that. And of course, in order to build housing, you need the land. So, you know, it is important to think about aspirations and having those sort of big dreams and finding out from those people who are doing these things how they do them. So it's also a case when identifying these spaces to use your imagination about what is possible. What does a community want its local area to be like? You know, it is a case of people being ambitious, having the opportunity to think about, you know, how they'd like to see change, how they'd like to see that, that, that developing and changing uh, in a way which involves them. So it's also then about other opportunities to create new community spaces or services and is there anything missing or in short supply? Um, so when you when you sort of add all that together you can quite easily do that by um, a, a range of different techniques so you know getting something off Google Maps and then having a walk around uh, certainly is an approach I've seen seen from some areas to do um, so that's that's definitely an approach to think of this example is a bit of a double-edged sword as well I mean I've, I've sort of recycled this and in this instance actually it's about showing um, some areas may possibly have too many facilities uh, and as a result they're all counter competing with each other and as a result there isn't really a demand uh, certainly um, for them to all continue and occasions sometimes that does need to happen where uh, there does need to be um, uh, some 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 to move away or, or close as a result but generally if a community uh, are all have got capacity to use those facilities more and better then this is definitely a good thing good thing for people to do but more importantly as I say this is about um, a more positive story of being able to share what communities to say what's important to them and do it as a walkabout so getting people behind your project uh, behind your project in a, in a positive way of course um, so in this instance it is um, it is about you want, sorry, uh, in this sense it's about you won't be able to do all of this on your own and nor should you. It's crucial to uh, have your community involved. You will need a wide range of people and skills uh, to take on all the roles. So for example, if you're growing and developing a project and you need fundraising, well fundraising uh, does require um, certain skills. Similarly, people to organise meetings, people who have kind of got good social media, uh, marketing kind of approaches, people who are good at attracting volunteers. So, you know, it's, it's important to start thinking about the wide range of skills um, that you will need. But as I say, it's about growing these, developing these uh, and being able to tell a story. The story is the crucial bit in all of this. If you don't have a good story, then why would people want to get involved? If you do have a good story and you make it relevant to people, then people are much more likely to want to get engaged. So questions to ask the community, what do you want to know? Um, and that sort of links to the idea of, you know, we're, we're here interested in this endangered space. Um, if we were to uh, try and save it, what sort of things would you want to know about that and how to do that? Um, who are you going to ask about it? So clearly uh, understanding your audience, um, you know, at what point uh, do you stop treating people as local? Uh, how will these people be involved? Um, so thinking about if you want to do online polls or, or meetings, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, very much think about the best approaches to contact people, questionnaires, meetings, door knocking. Door knocking be a really powerful one, but also door knocking for some people would be something they really wouldn't feel comfortable doing. So it is thinking about your resources and opportunities to bring people together. Yeah, so as I said, I think it's really important if you, there's certain messages you get out of this session is that there are but sometimes too many people who think they can do it all and so as a result of that lots of other people are happy to let them try um, don't be afraid to ask for help in fact it's essential that you do it won't be a community project if there's only a few people leading it so you know it's really important to have 
uh, good engagement. Something else interesting, um, the average trustee age is around 56. Um, quite often there's a reliance on retired people, but you know the reality is it's important to have reach and access across communities. So if the facility has strong family links, then clearly you want families uh, to be involved with it um, and to form part of your core audience. Um, it's also important over the longer term to think about uh, Re recruiting and retaining people because some people want to do short sharp discrete bits of support others will want want to do longer term or be happy to do longer term so you know it is thinking about how you how you keep people engaged and involved similarly uh, there are lots of opportunities to encourage people to offer what they're good at and interested in and then seek to identify uh, any skills gaps by uh, you know plugging some of those gaps by thinking about um, for example, if you were looking to um, take over a building and there was going to be a lot of uh, capital build, then you would probably want to be linking in with some local builders or people that you know who could say, yeah, actually, though, those builders quotes are quite reasonable or no, you're absolutely being stung there. That's not, not relevant and appropriate. Similarly, it's important to think about how you communicate with the community, uh, say plain English, using examples, um, such as maybe lots of diagrams if it's for people you work in, you want to work in communities where English is a sort of second language rather than the first. So, you know, it's it's important to think of those sorts of aspects. So uh, how to think about uh, reaching your audiences, um, young people, families through schools, older people through libraries, social clubs, putting up posters, different ways of talking to people so that you don't exclude those who face additional barriers that prevent them from taking part. Um, as I said, just use that example there earlier on about images. Um, social media, Facebook, Twitter uh, pages are very, very powerful ways. I certainly know lots of groups who um, are quite well advanced who actually get most of their communication through through their um, Facebook pages and have hundreds if not thousands of people doing it um, because something is, uh, is a quite fairly addictive about Facebook that means lots of people are constantly on it. Um, it's also about keeping people up to date uh, with the project so uh, following the line of you said so we did kind of approach just to make sure um, people are aware. As I said before, it's all about being able to tell your story. So in terms of types of community ownership, uh, I won't dwell on this one too long because it's quite technical and complex, but there are two ways for communities to own community space. So the first one is to do a community asset transfer, and this is a negotiation between a public body and a community for the transfer of a building or land. These are mostly done in the form of a lease, so let's say uh, at least 25 years, but on occasions there can also be freehold. Um, community asset transfers, uh, this, this isn't scientific, but um, locality estimate there's up to a thousand of these happen every year. Um, so, you know, they, they certainly are something which can happen. But as I mentioned earlier on before, uh, community asset transfer is quite a well is usually quite a long protracted process of negotiation uh, fundraising and a whole range of other things so you know it is it is something which which takes time to sort of grow and build but there are lots and lots of examples of communities taking over their assets because they know if they don't um, the council will sell it and the odds are they'll set it for uh, housing or whatever else um, so you know it's it's case of this is a vehicle to you. The other thing to do to buy yourself a bit of time is something called through the community right to bid is registering an asset community value. You may well have come up and heard about these. Uh, for example, I think there was one on the arches not so long ago. Um, and, you know, it's basically an opportunity to raise funding uh, during a moratorium. So if, if you accept it as, as an asset community value from the local authority, um, when, the, when it comes on the market, then you you can trigger a moratorium where in effect you're given six months in order to have time to put a, a bid together. Uh, the downside is that you, the owner doesn't have to accept that bid, um, but it is certainly a, an approach which can be quite powerful for groups to, to buy them time and also make um, owners, particularly if they're looking to make a quick buck, uh, think twice about sort of doing that so you know it isn't foolproof but it certainly is an option for you in terms of um, trying to 
bring your bring your dream to reality by having the opportunity to try and get in there and purchase property or at least have the chance to. Okay, simple ways to help your endangered space. Um, for, for a lot of groups and particularly uh, whilst you're developing confidence and confidence is clearly a big part of this, um, it's important to support what what spaces you've got so you know in this instance it's about maybe uh, renting a room for meetings or celebrations so you know that that's going to provide the organization with income particularly if they're struggling uh, thinking about volunteering a skill such as painting or speaking a second language and offering that so um, you know the activities and services being offered there can improve and, and be of better quality so more people use them it's thinking about starting a local interest group and holding it at the space so you know again they, they can charge um, uh, room higher rates it's about thinking about going to classes or group activities there because you know a lot of these sometimes they will have funding provided but funders will be looking for there to be good outcomes in terms of you know good numbers of people but of course uh, it may well be also about um, local community businesses uh, let's say Zumba class or whatever who uh, in order to be successful need to have people there who are going to um, you know uh, use this use the service and make it viable for them to do it so and of course if they have a cafe or shop use it uh, or donate to it or whatever that might be so you know it's important to understand and and do these simple little measures particularly as I say uh, groups are growing in confidence and thinking about how they do things Okay, then funding for early stage community groups and projects. Um, it's really important to use local contacts and to fundraise through activities such as raffles, ask for prizes from local businesses, local donations of equipment, money, sponsorships, subscriptions, contributions. Uh, for example, I'm involved with a local football team and we had um, a local football tournament and as part of that we needed to do some fundraising and we got about 30 different uh, prizes donated and it wasn't a case of hard sell at all then um, for example the local boots um, put uh, basically put prizes to one side as, as donations similar with m &S. Um, but you know it doesn't have to be expensive sort of shops in that certain sense it can be others and I'm sure even the co-op do but uh, you can tell me if that's right or wrong but certainly we, we, we've sort of found that, that to be very useful and as long as you've kind of got people who are plucky and happy to go and knock on doors or offices or whatever you know it, it certainly can provide good opportunities um, then thinking about micro grants so you know there are lots of opportunities to raise up to, get up to a few hundred pounds or even up to a thousand pounds from various places some of which can be very local so it can be local funders so for example you may have um, a, a county-wide community foundation who have small grants where where they're happy to sort of give them out to groups um, and these can be from also local councillors local authorities have discretionary grant pots or organizations such as rotary clubs you know are available um, as well on occasion so it's just understanding your area um, and again i'm probably teaching grandma to suck eggs here in terms of the reality that you probably do all of this through the co-ops anyway but you know it's important to sort of share that um, so as, as as groups okay so you, you've set yourself up you're doing things um, I think it's important particularly if you're then starting to look to want to access grants um, to provide some reassurance that the groups should consider becoming unincorporated um, association with the constitution so unincorporated means you haven't sort of got a legal structure in that sense but uh, you have a constitution which is a statement of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it it doesn't need to be more than a couple of pages um, and it's also a case that you have a bank account if you have those two um, then the odds are uh, that's good enough for lots of funders so for example I know with uh, what was big lottery fund uh, you can apply for grants such as awards for which is grants up to ten thousand pounds if you have a constitution and a bank account um, so you know it, it's a sort of a good way of growing developing and accessing funding similarly if you want to get grants over ten thousand pounds then you will almost certainly will need to have uh, set yourselves up as a company limited by guarantee or having some sort of charitable status um, where you become incorporated um, 
and in that way you're more able to access significant funding but you're also better equipped to uh, run yourself in a more professional way and take less risk of personal liability or any of those sorts of issues about mismanagement so you know do, do think about that sort of growth pattern and how you do it the reality is funders will often want to see you have a track record so uh, i think it's important for you to be able to grow at your own pace um, and then then sort of go for small grants with some of the big big funders like the lottery um, and then once those funders can see that you've got a track record and that you've been able to manage that, that grant effectively then they're much more willing um, to then fund you for larger grants if that's what you want to do linked to some some of the bigger projects we talked about earlier on okay um, so the supporting documents um, as I mentioned the first one is uh, endangered space is what you need to know before you start document um, again we've tried to make it light touch uh, the second one has a little bit more detail so it's an extended document um, and has a bit more of a pick and mix for you to sort of think about and then the third one is about resources and further reading so as I mentioned before okay actually there's over 50 links rather than what I said earlier on so a really wide range of useful information sources we should keep um, we should help you with wide range of inquiries you receive so you know they are hopefully decent documents and you know, very much the starting point for you to read those and come and work with locality to find out how we can support you more um, I'm just going to quickly now just give you an example of a space around me which um, has moved on that journey and been successful in doing that so it's a safe space um, my little pun here it was arc wrong before it was arc right so the area is called community uh, it's, it's, it's got arc right gardens it was called um, and the reality was it was um, land which wasn't really used it was between two primary schools at best it was a rat run at worst it was a dumping ground and a place where people really didn't feel safe uh, lots of antisocial behavior going on and so forth um, in 2001 the arc right Meadows Community Gardens was created by local member residents coming together to transform part of this disused um, unloved rubbish strewn playing field into a green space for the local people to use this was done in baby steps by the local community as a result they've now got a really really nice space with a whole range of uh, facilities and again these facilities haven't happened because the group have wanted to do them these facilities have grown and developed because they've done constant um, constant conversations with the community they're constantly involved with the community and as a result um, people are using it because it provides them with what they want but you know there's clearly lots of challenges with uh, gardens and they don't run on fresh air they require lots of volunteering and support and the community understand that and that, that's what they do so this is what it looks like now it's it's a really really wonderful space um, it's I think they kind of get wheeled out whenever there's a royal visit or whatever and of course not every project can be like this but you know it's, it's a great project it's recognized nationally uh, on how good practice on how to run a community gardens and you know they're constantly working hard and diversifying income so they always remain an asset for the local people um, you know the reality is that there are lots of projects like this around um, but you know the, the key point here is there it's where a community have come together uh, they've made the project work and they've developed a community business which diversifies income users and they've got relative security with it now you know the reality is yeah they still need to tap into grants but uh, that's that's not something they they have to do totally it's all about being able to sort of diversify so um, I think we're going to sort of stop now and sort of have some sort of questions I'm sure hopefully as you've been going along some sort of questions have been um, coming along so and I see there have been okay so let me go right to the top my lord I hope we have time to do all of these um, okay here we go so Peter Cox has asked a question uh, and it's to you uh, Anna, uh, why 2,000 spaces? What's the logic research distribution? 
Hi, yeah, yeah. So um, when we started to look at what we could meaningfully do, <clears throat> excuse me, under the, um, the cooperate, uh, cooperate pillar, pillar, what we tried what to do we tried was look at what we co-op already do in this space, what we already have as as assets, um, what we already fund through co-op foundation, local community fund, etc. Um, and we've tried to be quite challenging with the targets, but also realistic. Um, and there, there is a bit of there is a bit of science behind where we got the the 2000 from. Um, it's come out of various bits of research that I talked about at the beginning around um, what the wellbeing index suggested might be um, areas that we wanted to focus on, and um, as I said, around what we already have at the co-op and how we can how we can challenge ourselves to to push push that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It's it's quite it is quite a there is there is some maths behind it. It is quite technical. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Anna. And whilst you were doing that, I realised uh, you'd actually responded to that question earlier on. But I've, has given I've been time. busily trying to answer yes. as many as I could. Thank you very much. Okay, so there, there's still a few at the end, so we'll sort of go with those. Um, so in this, it's for Steve. Um, I have flagged this issue up generally and as a specific several times at conference via email one of our local causes bereavement service which is desperate for space has asked me again recently added to this members of the general public who know i work for the co-op group frequently comment about the decrepit state of key building um i think i think if if i can answer broadly and potentially if, if it's not on on target someone can probably ask another question but we're, we're conscious that obviously whenever you have a conversation around spaces and concern for for the disposal of spaces in our communities you you sort of have to look at your own organization and the question is what is the co-op doing about this, the spaces that it owns because obviously we have a, we have a fair amount of, of land at our disposal we have um rooms or offices available sometimes above our stores and you know we have stores that we haven't yet sold off um, if we've closed them down uh, for, for whatever reason um, so you do have to look at your own sort of portfolio um, and we do have a project at the moment where our property team are going through um, our portfolio looking at what spaces we currently use and what spaces we could use what the issues are in terms of access or health and safety what investment might be required to bring some of those spaces into community use, how you might be able to use some buildings in a kind of meanwhile capacity um, as a building might transition sort of in ownership or from one role into another within our wider estate. That that piece of work is being undertaken. Uh, it's quite an extensive piece of work, as you can imagine. And uh, at some, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll be able to give member pioneers and our, our customer members an insight into how we're going to be using what spaces we have available for the benefit of the community where it's appropriate. Great, thank you Stephen. Uh, there's there a few more. Uh, this one is from Fiona. Uh, are the documents on the coordinator section of the hall or, or just the MP MP area? And that, that's for you Steve. And that, that's for you Steve. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> My answer is I don't know. If they're not already on the hub, they soon will be. Um, obviously, there was uh, information sent out about the campaign on the 28th of June, um, and we've got we want to get those toolkits up and accessible to people and have them on the hub as a reference guide as well. Okay. Um, okay. Um, John. This one's from Alison Pope. Uh, what about linking up with organisations that are not such as voluntary services, uh, which already support community groups and hence spaces? I have a meeting next week, which I'll be highlighting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key thing with all of the work we're doing on spaces, we're not asking member pioneers to go out and lead, um, you know, a campaign on a particular space or a valuable asset in the community. Uh, and because I've noticed that one or two colleagues have mentioned about the the shortage of hours because obviously pioneers are only on four hours a week. I mean, I think the, the, the key thing is that we can draw people's attention to sort of what is a valuable asset in their community and give them some guidance around where to go to find answers around how to engage with the community, how to sort of empower people to look at potentially um, getting more involved in the saving or improving of a community space. And in, in some circumstances as well, you know, looking for guidance and potentially funding for those those groups who are looking to take a, 
a kind of a more um, positive step towards considering community ownership in some way. And I think that's why the resources and the toolkits that you've helped provide through locality is so key, because it, they do sort of set out a tiered approach that you can start off at a very basic level, just drawing people's attention to what a valuable commodity or a, a, a space might be in a community or a particular building might be, and how people can support it in some of the ways you outlined in the presentation. But also, there's enough material in the toolkits to be able to enable people to start to ask questions using the service that you're providing and to, to guide people down a route which might lead to a much bigger, more involved project. Um, that not necessarily asking pioneers to lead, but at least show people what's out there to enable them to sort of bring about their own solution and to sort of engage more with the community to help provide um, support to, to tackle these issues as and when they arise. That's great. Thank you very That's much great. for that, Steve. And I absolutely Thank echo that. Absolutely I mean, there are the resources to use, resources and local CBSs are CBS a good CBS point. Also, access to information, information, setting yourselves up, setting yourselves governance up, structure, up, being constituted, fundraising opportunities, and so forth, too. So, yeah, don't be aware we can do this. Can do this. Okay, there's the okay, that, there's uh, point, point from Rona, point from which Rona, is I have a group that is looking at community gardens. gardens. So I think that was in relation to the example I gave earlier on. And in that instance, in that uh, it's, 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 the native gardens, gardens are art crafts, community gardens in Nottingham. So if you Google that, it will come up that using that earlier on today. That helps. I'm getting a bit of echo feedback. I don't know whether whether your microphone's on or not. I'm just uh, trying to mute myself as we speak. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so for um, so for the spaces for, um, above and the stores, why can't we let the why can't we let, we let, these, let these out? Why can't we let some these of our out? colleagues that are struggling okay. with housing, low-income families low within the business. Um, within the business. Um, I guess it's one for either. I guess it's one for either. Uh, Steve, Steve, I guess you. You need to unmute yourself now. Unmuted. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a it's an, an interesting suggestion. I think that's part of the consideration that we're looking at in terms of how we utilise the spaces we do have. I mean, there's there's lots of you know, in certain in some of our portfolio, lots of space above our stores, which isn't necessarily being used currently as accommodation or for storage or meetings. So I think you know that's one of the issues that will undoubtedly be part of that wider review I was mentioning earlier. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, yeah, Rona's just saying she's a locality member. I'll come on to locality membership in a bit. Um, and I think you're saying generally you've had good experiences with that. So that's good to hear. Thank you very much for that, Rona. Um, another co-op focus, we have a medium-sized shop that is overspaced and I would love it to be used as a community space. Um, another one for you, Steve. Yeah, sorry, my, my mute button's not working properly at the moment. So, um, so yeah, I think in terms of um, space um, on the shop floor or off the shop floor, there are a number of, of issues we need to consider in terms of, you know, what's a viable retail space for the community? You know, are we serving our customers in terms of providing them, you know, with the right kind of range in that space um, uh, if, if it's um, sort of financially viable? But I think if we are looking to change the layout or we're looking to reduce space or there's an area at the back of the store that we we can re-engineer. I think part of that wider review is going to be looking at how do you make that space accessible while still sort of maintaining the security of the store itself. I think it's very keen for us to to reach out to to try and make our space um, usable wherever we can. As I said earlier, that's part of bringing attention to to how valuable space is as a commodity within our communities. But we've also obviously got to think about the safety of our of our stock and our colleagues and um, making sure that obviously that where we do have a store that it, it is serving the needs of our customer members uh, in the way that it should do. Um, so it's always going to be a compromise. I think we're not ruling anything out at this stage, but it's probably too early for me to give any kind of indication of what that property uh, review will look like um, at this stage. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, great, a thank question you. from um, a question Stuart from Matthew. Matthew. Um, Matthew. I have a group already trying to save a historic building to use as a community building. space. As an established group, how do we use these tools to help? Um, yep, fair question. A locality, we've got a very good working relationship with um, 
what is now called the Heritage Fund, a part of the lottery, um, and we've helped with publications. And again, it, it's, it's one of the links in the document called Pillars of the Community, and it's very much lots, lots of information in there around how you can um, develop and grow uh, buildings which have kind of got heritage positive to them but you'll equally be aware that sometimes there's a liability that comes with heritage projects as well so yes we do have lots of information and support and if there's things more things you wanted to know about that then of course do do get in touch with us on that sense okay um i'll try and whistle through these very quickly because i'm just conscious we said we'd try and do this all by seven uh, can we have maximum publicity about what we are trying to achieve tv advertising posters in stores social media i guess that's one for you anna it, it's a really it's a really great question. Um, I think co-op have always done a lot of really, really great stuff. We haven't always been that great at talking about it and shouting about the difference and the co-op difference. Now that we've got our community strategy, I think you will start to see a lot more of that coming through and about how community is truly at the heart of, of, of our co-op and what we what we do. You will see um, from the recent advertisements that came out um, in May, I think it was just, just around the AGM time, that for the first time ever, we're starting to make that link between what we do as co-op as a business and how that benefits our communities. So you'll have seen um, the, the, the advertisements linking uh, funeral, funeral care and funeral plans with the work in the academies, linking our member pioneers to um, car insurance and linking our local community funds to um, to food sales. So we've started to, to already talk about ourselves in that space that just by shopping at the co-op, you can make a difference. Obviously, this is taking that step further. And we're saying that even if you're not being, I don't really like the word passive, but you know, shopping at the co-op is, is more of a passive way to help your community. Actually, what we want to do is to help people to come together um, to cooperate, to really get together and um, and use use co-op almost as a bit of a, a springboard to um, to enable that activity. So I think it's something that you will start to see us talking about a lot more. Um, we do have plans for where, where else we can take our our mission to save spaces and increase the well-being in communities and to give people more skills and more opportunities to make them um give them the, the, the best chance they can in life we are really early into this campaign um so what i would say is just just keep keep watching watching this space and um, there will be some more good stuff coming out there's a there's a lot we have a lot of ideas and a, there's a lot of backing behind it um, from senior exec from our members council etc um, but thanks for the question it's a it's a really really good one and good to hear that you you you're proud of co-op and, and want to shout about all the good stuff we're doing Great, thank you very much. Um, Alison's asked a question, will we be able to see the questions answers after this webinar? Yes, it is recorded and yes, you will be able to come on and see what the questions were. So that's a nice, quick, simple one. Um, quick question for Peter Cox. Um, I think one of our biggest roles could be to bring together those already in this space, e.g. Cardiff Civic Society, the council, local councillors, already successful schemes, including a brilliant new co-op. Yeah, absolutely, it is very much about uh, working in collaboration. The reality is you have to do that in order to, to get things done anyway. But um, yes, I, I don't know whether Steve or Anna got anything else to add. I, I would just concur with that. It's absolutely all about cooperation. Um, Co-op know that we can't do this by ourselves. That's why we've partnered with organisations such as Locality and, and others to, to get um, to get this campaign off the ground and get the resources and tools that we need. It's why we're bringing our member pioneers onto webinars like this and why we're producing toolkits to try and give you guys the tools that you need to have these conversations to bring people together. Um, it, it, that's absolutely what, it, what it's all about. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, quick question from Alison again. Uh, will member pioneers be kept up to speed with property portfolio? Um, review that's one for you steve it's i can take that um 
Yes, probably is is the best answer I can give at the moment. It is a review that's taking place at the moment. Um, it probably won't be in detail, but it probably will be that where we identify that there's a space that um, either doesn't need a lot of investment or needs um, needs a, a small amount of time, resource, um, etc. put against it, we will absolutely be looking at where we have member pioneers to help um, coordinate some of that stuff and, and link you in and let you know what's going on in your areas. Um, yes, okay, great, we, we, you know, you. we're not keeping anything secret from you. Yeah. Great. Uh, one from Kevin Price. It's quite a long one, Kevin, and I can't read the end of it, unfortunately. But um, I would actually like to have a chat with you about this. I know Snenton uh, market very well. I regularly go there to get Turkish bread because it's the best bread in Nottingham by a long way. Um, and I'm also aware we've got some locality members there. So if you'd like to drop me an email, uh, I'd certainly like to happy and be happy to talk to you about it. It's mick.mcgrath at locality dot org dot uk uh, but hopefully you can find that easily enough but yeah by all means give me a call because i'm always interested in that sort of thing um okay we'll just try and wrap up these last few i'm just just conscious of time um the question about what about closures of post offices uh, so i'm not quite sure i understand the question sorry no, I'm, ass I'm assuming it's maybe about... You mean sort of post offices that were in co-ops? Possibly, no. probably. Not sure. Uh, if, if whoever's posted that question, if you can uh, drop us a line, um, either to to Mick or, or myself or Stephen, um, and we'll we'll try and pick up um, and answer it as, as fully as we can, I think, best thing. Yeah. OK, one from Paul Taylor Burr. Can we turn empty spaces into charity shops, including cafes, with the beneficiaries being the co-op charity partner? Um, yeah, you aware, there's, there's lots of the charity shops and some locality members have got them. Some charity shops absolutely fly uh, because they have good stock and they're able to get it from good sources. Others really, really struggle. Same, same with cafes. The average cafe tends to make about £15,000 a year. Uh, the vast majority of them make a loss so you know you have to be careful with which sort of choosing the right kind of uh, approach or just being going into it with your eyes wide open and um, understanding the risks and you know factoring in that but again from that co-op perspective I don't know whether you've got any view. I, I think sorry Mick I think you just unmuted me I'm having major issues um, getting access to the mute button on my uh, laptop at the moment um, uh, in terms of trying to to turn over space to those kind of activities, I, I think it, I, I know we keep going back to this review, but I don't want to rule anything out at this stage. But I have to kind of see what um, what if you like what the situation is and what what the possible might be. Um, I think one of the things I'm conscious of though is that we can't do it all, and the member pioneer can't do it all. So it's very much about the sort of the people who are trying to save the space or get involved in in this kind of issue being guided and advised or supported by the pioneer, but not led by the pioneer. So, you know, it's, it's not about us sort of saying you need a cafe or, or us saying, you know, you need a shop. It's about the community deciding what, what it believes is important and about sufficient people coming together with some guidance and assistance from the pioneer to, to sort of help bring that, bring that to life, if you like. Um, you know, and obviously if someone did approach us, um, with a suggestion like uh, using part of our space in maybe in a meanwhile capacity as they call it for a cafe or a shop then you know if we know where we stand on our portfolio and what the assets are that we've got available that we can make available to the community then obviously we can respond accordingly but i think it's just too early to say at this stage but um you know we'll it can all be fed into the just discussions we have so when we do come forward with a solution it's one that's sort of taken all of these issues into consideration Brilliant, thank you. Um, quick one from Peter Cox. Anna, please, can we have Anna, social media capital, social media email, made uh, graphics, uh, plan, Twitter campaigns, etc. Um, yes, so we do already have quite a lot of social media assets that I think are in the hub, but I will double check, and if they're not, we can put them in there. Um, there's, we've got lots of Twitter banners. Um, you may have seen some of the um, some of the still images that we've that we've produced. There is going to be some more social media um, activity. Happy to 
share a, a plan of what what we think is coming up um and the short answer is yes absolutely peter if there's something that you think you need or would like and you can't see the thing that you would like then give us a shout and we can look at what we can do to help absolutely great thank you um so just you, you people keep keep typing in questions you're very naughty you know we all got homes to go to but we'll, we'll carry on and there's there's only a couple more to go uh, but i have to say this says a lot about you as a group that you're willing to take take time out in your evenings and so forth to do this and learn it, it's it's very impressive um okay sorry just looking at this one here as a member of a group they've already started into a registered asset community value uh, moratorium period we have come up against the situation that very few grants are available uh, to purchase buildings how do you approach these these problems yeah it's a fair comment and a lot of it will be linked to what i was saying earlier on about where the group's at in terms of um, whether it's constituted because if it's not and you're asking significant amounts of money that's always going to be high risk and arguably a risk that groups won't uh, funders won't want to take but certainly by contacting um, the email address which I mentioned earlier on and, and Jeremy he will give you some some very detailed answers around that so uh, examples off the top of my head there are examples where local communities have saved their local pub for example by doing community share offers where ultimately they raise money through the community who purchase shares on a, on a sort of one 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 chair one vote um, kind of approach which has worked for hundreds of, of groups now so you know there are there are ways and means around it but yeah it is true it is it is hard to access uh, funding um, to, to purchase properties so that that is one which isn't easy but you know there are solutions uh, Karen Piltington saying yep yeah, brilliant webinar looking forward to sharing the toolkits thank you for that Karen um, Peter Cox similarly happy with that um, so I think there was just one final one um, which was about coming back to the post office is and yeah sorry I, yeah sorry could post offices go into co-ops or is there uh, a way of reopening them did you already answer that one Anna um, I, I don't think I did could post offices go into co-ops I mean that's that's probably a um, want to take away um, it's not something that it, it's not something that we could deal with in terms of um, the spaces campaign um, it's more of a kind of commercial decision I would guess yeah okay um, one here from Alison please can advertising and new projects and initiatives be linked up the comment I often get is that what the co-op is doing is still not publicized enough in consequence community groups often miss out um, I think it's it's probably links to what I said earlier about the um, linking to starting to link in together what we do as a co-op um, and what impact that then has on the community. So the advertising, etc., showing the impact that that has, making more of um, things like our local community fund and the benefit that that's had and the the money that it's raised and the impact that that has in in the area. Um, if there's something that you're thinking of specifically around um, talking about how we activate man pioneers or what we're doing in this particular campaign, um, I guess that's one to suggest to add your member pioneer coordinator or member pioneer manager and see um, see what what is appropriate in your area and um, and how we how we talk about it and how we activate some some really good stuff in in your area depending on what your community wants um without knowing where the where that member pioneer is I, I probably couldn't really comment but certainly in terms of the the wider kind of mass activation as i said earlier you will start to see that a lot more coming out of this campaign great and uh, just finishing off with these uh, kevin price has said he's supporting a skate nottingham um I'm assuming that that's sort of project going on there and they've got an amazing plan which you'll share and this is what this is all about it's about networks it's about being able to share information knowledge um, what you might not think is particularly useful is really useful and again part of the locality model is for people to share the stuff that's worked but just as importantly to share the stuff that hasn't worked and people are often happy to do that because they don't want other people to necessarily make those same kind of mistakes um, okay 
and we'll now sort of move on to the final bit given we're we are running slightly over um, so poll three so hopefully that's that's come up um, if this has been useful to you what other webinars might you find useful uh, there's some examples there um, if you've got other ideas by all means put them in um, in the question box and we, again we can look at this uh, later on okay um, I think people are generally voted now then so that's helpful thank you 86% around fundraising and accessing skills uh, nearly 60% uh, around community asset transfer process, 17% others. As I say, that's a slightly loaded poll, I know, because I've asked two of the things, but um, you know, by all means, if you have got other ideas for things that you'd like to, to get advice support on with, with locality, how we can improve uh, well, the way we do these webinars, by all means, do let us know through through the sort of question part or through your conversations uh, with Jeremy, for example, as well. So I think with that, we are probably all done and have got things to do. I've already mentioned locality membership organisation. If you come across groups who you feel might uh, benefit from locality membership, by all means, um, do do sort of share this link with them. Uh, I won't say any more than that. Um, so really now it's just about uh, saying thank you very much for your time, your patience. Um, hopefully you found this process quite useful uh, and helpful to you. Um, and you thank you very much for your contributions. I don't know whether Mick, that animal stick got his mistake. Yeah, um, Mick, I just wanted to say that one of the colleagues was asking about um, whether or not the information was on the Pioneer Hub. Um, I've just checked and it's, it's head, headlining the Pioneer Hub at the moment. So um, a summary of the Cooperate 2022 campaign is there, as well as all three toolkits and a link through to the locality supported um, service where uh, colleagues can ask questions around saving spaces and uh, highlight any issues they might like further information on. That's all. That's all linked from the hub. Um, just follow the Cooperate 2022 link and you'll find it there. And the only other thing I wanted to say is just that um, it, it's this is a huge topic. It can be quite daunting. There's a lot of information in in the toolkits and a lot of links to organisations that are out there and the policy that surrounds these issues. Um, take it step by step. You know, you, you're the, the catalyst, the connector, um, you know, the communicators. You don't need to do all of this on your own. Um, you're there to help signpost. You're there to help maybe guide, point people in direction, right direction, and maybe facilitate people learning more. Um, about how they can help um, save spaces in their communities. So, you know, don't think you have to lead these campaigns, be there to support them and guide them where you can. Um, but not every one of these activities will end in an asset transfer. Um, so don't be too daunted by, by what's ahead of you. But um, do try and make sure that people know that we're there uh, as a co-op concerned about the challenges that their communities face. And we're here to kind of support them, helping them to save their community spaces. Great. Uh, thank you very much Great. for that. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very, very much, much for, that. for uh, providing you your, your lively inputs. And yeah, uh, until the next time, good luck with it all and we salute you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.